Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Popular Participation in the Making of Brazil's 1988 Constitution, presented in collaboration with the Harvard Mellon Urban Initiative. My name is Sidney Shalubi. I'm professor of history and of African and African-American studies at Harvard, and I'll be your moderator. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dan McDonald, a postdoctoral fellow at the Mahindra Humanities Center at Harvard, as well as a research fellow at the Harvard Mellon Urban Initiative. Also joining us today as a discussant is Victoria Langland, Associate Professor at the University of Michigan. Professor Langland is the author of Speaking of Flowers, Student Movements and the Making and Remembering of 1968 in Military Brazil, and she is the co-editor of the Brazil Reader, History, Culture, Politics, both by Duke University Press. So thank you both for agreeing to have this conversation with us. Today, Dan is going to discuss how Brazilian citizens submitted 122 amendas populares or popular amendments to the Constitutional Assembly, 1987-1988, tasked with crafting Brazil's new democratic constitution. Daniel McDonald's research points to this remarkable exercise in direct democracy as a key inflection point in Brazil's transition from military dictatorship, 1964 to 1985, to democracy. His examination of the popular amendments offers new understandings of the desires and aspirations of everyday Brazilians for their new democracy, as well as the lingering legacies of two decades of authoritarian rule that continue to complicate its consolidation. Before I move on, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. First, uh, we'll be recording today's webinar and it will be available on the Dr. Class YouTube channel shortly after today's session. We also email a link to the recording to everyone who has registered. Second, uh, we hope to see you at other lectures and series that we host here at Dr. Class. In the chat, we've added links to our online calendar as well as social media channels. I'd encourage you all to follow us there for the most up-to-date information on upcoming events. Um, next, we'd love to hear from, your, from you during today's presentation. The chat function will be disabled but you, if you have a question for our speaker, please feel free to send it through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We'll be answering questions at the end of the session, but feel free to submit them at any time. So without any further delay, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming our speaker, Dan McDonald. Welcome, Dan. Okay, everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you, Professor Shalubi, uh, for moderating today my talk today, and thank you, Professor Langland, for offering commentary, and to all of you uh, for being here today. So I'm going to share my screen with you, so you can see the PowerPoint here. Okay, can everyone see that? Great. Okay, so I'm going to start with a quick anecdote. Okay, great. So on September 1st, 1997, Jose Gomez Pimenta addressed the National Constituent Assembly charged with writing a new democratic constitution for Brazil. Pimenta, though, was not an elected member of the assembly. Rather, he was a former construction worker from an industrial suburb of Belo Horizonte in Minas Gerais State, a labor leader and state congressman who had been imprisoned and had his political rights taken away during Brazil's 21 year military, civil military dictatorship. And Pimenta identified himself as a simple worker who had come on behalf of working people to defend effective popular participation in the making of Brazil's post-dictatorship democracy. And he emphasized that the new constitution would have an enormous impact on the material lives of working class Brazilians, like the miners in his home state who suffered from dangerous working conditions and poor pay. And far from symbolic, Pimenta's evocation of popular participation underscored the stakes of his presence that day. And so he made the case for an amenda popular or popular amendment that was signed by 35,000 Brazilian citizens 
and sponsored by grassroots movements, labor uh, unions, and professional groups. And Pimenta stressed that everyday Brazilians wanted to contribute with their work, with their intelligence, uh, with their organizations to the strengthening of democratic institutions in the nascent New Republic. And his amendment was one of three, which sought to install permanent mechanisms uh, for direct democracy in Brazil's new constitution. Ultimately, uh, baptized as the uh, citizen constitution, the Constituição Cidadã. And in total, 122 popular amendments were supported by around 12 million signatures from everyday Brazilians. So today, I'm going to be sharing with you material from an article manuscript on the popular amendments and the Brazilian democratic transition. And I came to this project in a rather circuitous faction, uh, fashion. My current book project, Peripheral Citizenship, The Right to the City in 20th Century Sao Paulo, examines how everyday Brazilians in the city's urban periphery reimagined citizenship and democracy to meet the simultaneous rise of the megacity and authoritarianism. And in the latter part of the manuscript, I examined various forms of participatory democracy that grassroots movements created during the democratic transition. And among others, those experiments included citizens oversight councils within the state healthcare system. You can see some flyers from that right here. Um, a radical collective form of unemployment insurance and collective public housing construction. And of course, out of this ferment of, of grassroots democracy came the popular amendments. And in the book manuscript, I follow four popular amendments, uh, popular participation, a right to health on urban reform and women's rights from their grassroots movements in Sao Paulo's periphery. But this approach left unclear what the significant was uh, and, and the place of the popular amendments was with, within the democratic transition in Brazil and among democratic transitions in Latin America more broadly. And so based on some original research, this article in, in my, my talk today asks questions like, what does it mean that citizens could participate directly in making Brazil's post-dictatorship constitution? How should this unique experiment in direct democracy shape our understanding of the democratic transition in Brazil. Before we go any further, let's define exactly what uh, what the pop amendments were and their, what their place was in the constitution making process. So the popular amendments uh, did as their name suggested, they amended what was essentially a first draft of the constitution. So the constitutional assembly was gaveled into session February 1st, uh, 1987. In April, a uh, system of thematic commissions and subcommissions was established, and those elaborated in anteprojeto, really a kind of a first draft of the constitution, which they delivered in June. And then between June and early August, a period of about uh, eight weeks, sponsors of the popular amendments uh, could define what aspect of the first draft of the constitution their amendment would alter, and then collect the necessary 30,000 signatures. And then between August 26th and September 3rd, the sponsors of the amendment met the, that met the necessary signature threshold uh, made oral defenses of their amendments in front of uh, a central committee uh, within the Constitutional Assembly. And so from there, the popular amendments were voted on and either accepted in full, uh, partially, or rejected entirely. And then from there, the Constitution underwent several subsequent rounds of revision before a final vote in its uh, promulgation in October of 1988. And what this tells us is that as a mechanism of Constitution making, the, the popular amendments were rather limited. They could only really affect the first draft of the Constitution, and that draft underwent three major subsequent rounds of revision. And they still had to be voted on by the constituent deputies. But I wanna to argue today that the significance of the popular amendments lies less in their efficacy as constitution-making mechanisms, even if they did score some important victories, and we can talk about that later. Rather, the popular amendments broaden our conceptions of democratic transitions is not simply political affairs conducted primarily within the confines of formal political institutions or human rights trials, but rather one in which quotidian transformations permeated the formal political realm. And using the popular amendments, I frame the transitions as moments of potential rupture in which the struggle over their meaning evidence the swirling undercurrents of radical possibility. Uh, and this is especially relevant in the Brazilian case. And so by virtue of their diversity and origin in civil society, the popular amendments illustrate that by rhetorically grounding the democratic transition within 
other transitions already underway in Brazil, diverse groups waged a battle over the meaning of the transition through the amendments. Uh, and in the form of the popular amendments then, those multiple transitions came together in the writing of Brazil's constitution uh, from beyond the formal political or electoral system. Moreover, I would say that the popular amendments uh, demonstrate that the, the shift towards a citizenship framework more cognizant of racial, ethnic, gender, and other differences in late 20th century politics, uh, what some scholars have alternately termed the inclusive, inclusionary, or multicultural turn uh, in, in the larger context of this struggle over the meaning of the transition. And to be sure, groups had long mobilized identity to make such claims. But the popular amendment signaled the emergence of a new phase in which struggles over citizenship democracy in the 20th century uh, increasingly came to more overtly revolve around these issues of identity. And as a result, I, I propose that we reconsider the democratic transitions in Latin America, not as exclusively political affairs, a, a mere transition from authoritarian to ostensibly democratic rule, but as moments of potential rupture in even the most ostensibly conservative of uh, Latin America's democratic transitions. And so this is especially relevant given that an influential social science literature has long held the Brazilian transition as the most conservative uh, of, of the transitions in Latin America. Um, so in the late 20th century, uh, a wave of Cold War dictatorships in the region gave way to democracies. And within the context of South America, uh, Brazil experienced a prolonged period of redemocratization in which the military and its civilian allies largely retained control of the important levers of the political transition. And unlike their counterparts in Argentina or Chile, the Brazilian generals were able to more or less set the terms of their exit and did not face the trials or truth commissions uh, that their counterparts did immediately after leaving power, um, in, in the latter case, at least until the uh, truth commission in 2013 in Brazil. And just to give you a quick roadmap for the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna begin by examining the origins and significance of the popular amendments within the longer history of constitution making and political transitions in Brazil. And then I'm going to explore the campaign for popular participation in the making of Brazil's post authoritarian dictatorship and the signature gathering campaigns. And then I'm going to look at how proponents marshaled arguments about history in the oral defenses of the amendments in front of the Constitutional Assembly. And then uh, I will finish with how uh, some distinct groups drew on divergent histories of social mobilization to claim uh, full citizenship. So far from a sporadic event, constitution making is an integral part of Brazilian politics. Uh, since independence from Portugal in 1822, Brazil has had seven constitutions and five constitutional assemblies. Uh, two of those constitutions were opposed by authoritarian governments. And in fact, every political transition in the struggle between dictatorship and democracy that has dominated modern Brazilian history has pressed a write, rewriting of the country's highest law. And until recently, the focus on political elites and structural questions and outcomes has belied the importance of constitution making as, a, as key inflection points in political transitions, especially from the perspective of non-elite actors. The making of a new constitution sets a field of battle in which competing forces mobilize more than just constituencies and votes, but historical narratives that made sense of the political transition in question. And in Brazil's latest foray into democracy, demanding popular participation was a powerful way for diverse groups to frame the democratic transition as an exercise in broadening uh, citizenship. And so this interpretation differs in some key respects from previous scholarship on constitution making and political transitions in Brazil. This literature tends to frame constitution making as uh, fate accompli of the elite driven, highly packed political transitions that have dominated Brazilian history. And indicative of this view, the journalist Barbosa Lima Sobrinho, uh, who would later speak on behalf of a popular amendment, wrote that the historical role of, constitu of constituent assemblies was just to make contemporary Brazil's legal, legal framework without modernizing it. Uh, the post-independence uh, 1823 constitutional assembly, uh, to take one example, um, he said it simply negated the colonial pact, but accepted colonial conditions. And so constitution making in the 20th century oscillated between periods of expanded participation and authoritarian retreat. Uh, the, constitution, uh, the Constitutional Convention of 1934 featured some representatives elected by recognized trade unions. The 1937 constitution uh, was imposed by fiat uh, and, and instituted an authoritarian regime, the Estado Novo, 
uh, modeled after fascist Italy and Spain. Uh, with redemocratization, the 1946 Constitutional Assembly was uh, particularly notable for the participation of the Brazilian Communist Party during a brief window of legality and the presence of many politicians with popular class roots. Um, after the 1964 military coup, the dictatorship imposed a new constitution through a rump congress to replace the 1946 uh, constitution uh, and then used institutional acts to rule through extra constitutional means. Uh, in 1983 and 84, the largest street protest in Brazilian history, Jaita Ja, ultimately failed to secure the direct election of uh, the civilian successor to the last military president. And with the issue of the presidency temporary, temporarily resolved, replacing the military constitution still in force became an important issue during the first few years of Brazil's transition to uh, democratic rule after 1985. So in Sao Paulo, the Catholic Church professional organizations and grassroots movements launched the Plenario Pro Participação Popular na Constituinte, or the, the wonderfully named plen Plenary for Popular Participation in the Constituent Assembly, we're just going to call it the PPPC, uh, in January of that year. And initially, at issue was whether or not the new constitution would be written by Congress or an assembly elected specifically for that purpose. So in July 1985, the PPPC issued in a letter that would uh, that argue that any constitution written by a Congress uh, under the military constitution of 1967 would be arbitrary and illegitimate. And that became the line that they stuck with throughout the, this process. In any case, um, the civilian president, uh, Sané, signed a constitutional amendment to the 1967 constitution that did exactly that. And so this defeat led the national pro-participation groups to shift tactics to demanding uh, popular participation outside the normal electoral process. Uh, and the PPC elect, uh, adopted the slogan, uh, the Constituichi Sin Povo Nao Cria Nada de Novo. And so the campaign for per, uh, popular participation dovetailed with innumerable grassroots rallies and meetings to discuss the upcoming constitutional assembly. Uh, and this kind of became both a national pressure campaign and a mass civic education campaign uh, between 1986 and 87. And so they're too numerous to mention in their totality here, but these mobilizations were not restricted to large national groups uh, that, that have been active and pushing for democratization. Uh, so to cite one example from the book project, uh, women's grassroots movements in the urban periphery of Sao Paulo organized a series of summits, Moisia uh, Constituinci, us in the Constituent Assembly, in which they elaborated their priorities for the constitution. And after a sustained lobbying campaign, pro-participation groups won a mechanism for direct participation in the assembly. Um, and in our interview, the PPC's president, uh, Shika Whitaker, believed that the assembly adopted the proposal uh, precisely out of fear that progressive forces would continue attacking the constitutional process uh, as illegitimate. And so even with this victory, effectively utilizing the popular amendments was very challenging given the quick turnaround and other logistical issues. And so the PPC and its allies coordinated a series of events uh, to organize signature gathering and establish locations for the public to view the amendments. One of those was the uh, Sala da Constituinci in the University of Sao Paulo's downtown law school. And in addition, the PPPC issued issued a series, a special edition of its bulletin uh, called the Intercarta Cidadão uh, 30,000, which you can see here on the left, uh, in addition to their uh, regular bulletin on the right. Uh, and that title, of course, references the 30,000 signatures for each amendment uh, 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 to receive the right to defend it in front of the, the assembly. So the 122 amendments submitted to the Constituent Assembly represented a remarkable expression of popular will and mobilization. And together, the amendment totaled over 12 million signatures, uh, around 3.9% of Brazil's population at the time, a pretty significant number given the short period uh, to collect them. And so if we wanted to briefly touch on just the variety uh, of measures that were proposed, and you can see here the grouping um, of some of the most popular, uh, popular, popular amendments. Um, many, of, many of them were kind of redundant, and so I've grouped them here, um, but by far the most popular were to preserve uh, vocational training programs, uh, SESCI, SANACI, SESI, SANAI, uh, followed by agrarian reform, the pro-agrarian reform movements, uh, rights for children and labor rights and religious education. But this really uh, doesn't quite capture the just extraordinary variety of uh, measures that were proposed. 
um, all different kinds of social rights and welfare measures, uh, labor rights, both pro and against, uh, civil rights for uh, specific groups, uh, in addition to popular participation measures. Uh, but the things that were proposed went beyond, uh, uh, beyond rights and mechanisms for direct democracy. Uh, there were all different kinds of political reforms that were proposed, um, including uh, monarchists uh, looking for the restoration of the constitutional monarchy, um, economic reforms ranging from agrarian reform, urban reform, non-payment of Brazil's, uh, 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 Brazil's foreign debt, um, and, and a really stunning number of separatist movements, um, uh, particularly in the state of Minas Gerais, but elsewhere that were looking to carve out different states. Um, the only one that was successful of that group uh, was the uh, state of Tocantins, uh, which is created uh, out of the constitution. And the sheer number of groups that sponsored them is, is equally as staggering, uh, ranging from religious groups, uh, some of the, kind of the usual suspects perhaps, uh, professional organizations, trade and industry groups, uh, all different kinds of social movements ranging from large national movements to small neighborhood grassroots movements, um, a wide variety of labor groups as well, uh, and, and, and really running the, the gamut of Brazilian uh, civil society at the time. And so while the constitutional intervention of each amendment was by design narrow, the speakers often made sweeping arguments as to how their amendments addressed some past problem in service of securing Brazil's democratic future. And as a result, defenses of the amendments offer a glimpse into how diverse actors imagine the post-1985 transition within these longer struggles at a moment when Brazil's next chapter seemed relatively undecided. And broadly, these uh, amendments proposed measures that expanded social rights, defended state enterprises, uh, addressed legacies of authoritarian rule, and inscribed uh, uh, mechanisms for direct democracy, including making the popular uh, amendments a permanent feature of uh, Brazil's democratic system. And so the constituent deputies and the popular amendment speakers were well aware of both the contradictory constitutional grounds of the assembly in the importance of defining the transition beyond the confines of the constitution itself. So one constituent uh, deputy, Arturo da Tavola, stated during the popular amendment defenses that the constitutional assembly had not been born of a social movement properly said, and nor did it signify the formation of a new state. Rather, it, that it was an assembly that intends to revoke the juridical order that gendered it. And he called this a strange and anomalous situation but it meant that the Constitutional Assembly lacked a clear ideological reason for being. And so the defense of the popular amendments exploited that ambiguity to define what the Constitutional Assembly meant in the broad sweep of Brazilian history, and in doing so, try and uh, determine the country's future. And so though the legacy of the dictatorship uh, loomed large, speakers often drew on pre-dictatorship political frameworks to make those arguments. Um, perhaps the oldest such framework were the monarchists whose popular amendment called for a plebiscite on whether to restore Brazil's former imperial family deposed in 1889 to the throne. That was ultimately unsuccessful, uh, as we know. Uh, but most harken back to debates that had permeated Brazil since the mid 20th century. And so a good example is the defense offered by Barbosa Lima Sobrino, that was on the right there, in defense of a popular amendment for the maintenance of the state monopoly on oil exploration. So while the constitutional issue revolved around the relatively minor um, issue of risk, con risk contracts, Sobrino tied his amendment to what he called the largest movement in Brazilian history. And of course, this was a reference to the iconic campaign during the populist presidency of Getulio Vargas um, from 1950 to 1954, that with the slogan, O Petróleo Nosso, led to the creation of Petrobras and the state oil monopoly in 1953. And in fact, the, the resonance of this campaign was such that the backers of this popular amendment relaunched the campaign in the run-up, uh, at least some, symbolically relaunched the campaign in the run-up to the uh, constituent assembly. The next speaker, Valgia Ganza, evoked his own story as a migrant to frame the need for agrarian reform as central to the constitution. And so Gunzer introduced himself as a farmer born and raised in the Hausa who, like thousands of others, migrated to the Amazon to occupy new agricultural frontiers opened up by the Trans-Amazonian Highway. Uh, and he said he had been encouraged uh, by the dictatorship slogan, uh, the Amazon land without men for the man without land. Uh, 
And so throughout his speech, he grounded the democratic transition within this social transition. That is the mass exodus of millions of Nordestinos, of Northeasterners and other rural migrants to the Amazon and the even greater numbers that would uh, go to Brazil's cities. And in this way, Gunza framed the success of the democratic transition as dependent on whether or not it responded to the forces behind the rural exodus and migration. So Gunza concluded uh, by declaring that if the constitution lacked agrarian reform, that it would be, rightly be tossed into the dustbin of history. Um, and so, of course, the dictatorship of the, leg uh, of the, the legacy of the dictatorship loomed particularly large. Uh, Gisele Mendonça, uh, the president of the National Student Association, uh, UNI, spoke in defense of an amendment that would expressly prohibit the military from intervening in domestic affairs. And UNI's sponsorship of this amendment was significant. Uh, that it, the military dictatorship, of course, had disproportionately subjected students to surveillance, arrest, torture, and execution. And UNI in particular looked to the military's repression of their organization in the 1960s as an important part of its positioning as a kind of vanguard for progress. Um, and so Mendoza grounded her defense of military non-intervention in the long history of military interference in domestic politics uh, from the Tenochtitlan movement of the 1920s, the revolution of 1930, and the military dictatorship initiated, of course, by the, by the coup of 1964. And so in short, defenses of the popular amendments proposing political reforms and social rights showed how a diverse coalition would use the Constitutional Assembly to define the democratic transition as an exercise in instituting an expansive social citizenship uh, within a, a, a participatory decentralized democracy. And so indeed popular amendments proposed uh, permanent mechanisms for direct democracy uh, that would ground their legitimacy and the, that of the constitution as a whole, not in any legal precedent, but in the experience of Brazilians pushing for democracy over the past over the past decade in the 1970s and 1980s. And the PPC sponsored amendment uh, would give citizens the permanent right to propose constitutional amendments, provided they required sufficient signatures, and also allowed citizens to propose ordinary legislation through a similar process. And as the legal justification uh, submitted for another popular amendment, uh, uh, a parallel amendment for, the, for, for this mechanism said, uh, these mechanisms were entirely new in a juridical sense, but that they would create a respective or a collective responsibility of all society in the elaboration of the new constitution and therefore an investment in its legitimacy. And the right to do so, as one speaker put it, was, had, been earned, uh, had been earned through the involvement of everyday Brazilians in various forms of associational life, uh, things like labor unions, professional groups, and grassroots movements that he said had fulfilled the role of uh, an elementary school of democracy in politics. The public amendments uh, became an important vehicle for diverse groups to demand inclusion within this citizenship framework. And here I wanna detail too, um, how two did so, uh, the disabled rights movement and then the indigenous movement and how they used identity-based claims uh, to full citizenship. And so in the larger, Piece, I focus on two additional groups that include uh, women in the urban poor and Brazilian's megacities. But taken together, they signaled a shift in the politics of rights tour from more universalist expressions uh, during the dictatorship era to ones in which demands for inclusion more explicitly recognize inequalities uh, shaped by race and class and gender and sexuality and disability uh, and, and, and even place. And so while these groups have long claimed citizenship along these lines, uh, a history that they referenced in their defenses before the assembly, they seize this opportunity and uh, to more broadly place these demands uh, within the center of Brazilian politics in, a, in an unprecedented uh, manner. Um, and so in one popular amendment that had been submitted by national disability rights groups, uh, the defense of uh, Messias Tavares de Souza, who's seated there um, holding the box, uh, framed the expansion, extension of rights and welfare benefits to disabled persons as part of a larger civic awakening uh, during the long, slow return to democracy. And I'm just going to read a quick quote from his speech. He said, in the decade of the 1970s, disabled people, just like the Black movement, women, and other groups in civil society, resolved to organize on the question of survival. And then Susan went on to position his amendment and uh, the movement 
as really a first, first of all, as, as about the right to citizenship, which he said had as much to do with the material conditions of disabled people to participate in the public life, the right to come and go like any, uh, like any citizen. Uh, and to illustrate that argument, Scusa pointed out that he had the right to defend the popular amendment, but that he could not access the, physically access the microphone uh, that had been provided. So similarly, the indigenous movement uh, harkened back to a long history of abuse towards indigenous people and its demands for significant rights. Uh, Elton Kanaki the, is a member of the Kanaki people of Minnesota state, and he was a coordinator of a, of a national indigenous campaign in the constituent assembly, uh, defended, defended that, one, that, that amendment. And so in a particularly iconic event, you can look up this speech on YouTube, I highly recommend it. Um, with the galleries filled with indigenous people, Kanaki began painting his face black uh, with paint from the Jiripopu fruits as he framed his speech as not simply about the defense of an amendment, but as a cultural manifestation uh, for the insistent ag aggression suffered by indigenous people. And so Kanaki reminded the audience uh, that indigenous people were asking for nothing that did not legitimately already belong to them uh, as outlined in Brazil's existing laws. And the constituent deputies could not remain different anymore to the aggression of uh, economic power, of the greed and the ignorance uh, that had uh, um, resulted in the deaths of many indigenous people, uh, in particular land grabs by, uh, by um, uh, cattle interests in the Amazon and surrounding regions. And so how do we assess the impact of the popular amendments? I mean, one way is to look at how they have been used since 1988. So the uh, measure to introduce uh, uh, the Lei de Iniciativa Popular, the popular, uh, where citizens can propose laws direct, uh, directly, um, has yielded four cases. Uh, one of which is the uh, Caso Daniela Perez, which was a, uh, a telenovela star who had been murdered, which led to a modification of homicide laws. Uh, there were two anti-corruption uh, measures, uh, one that combated vote uh, buying, and another that led to the very well-known uh, Lei da Ficha Limpa, um, and another that created a, uh, a mechanism for funding social housing. And indeed, the, the Constitution of 1988 contained a massive expansion of rights, at least on paper, to education, health, and nutrition, uh, labor rights, and housing, just to name, just to name a few. But I, I, I would argue uh, that much of their importance of the, of the popular amendments lies elsewhere. And as the popular amendments laid claim to Brazil's democratic future, they articulated an expansive vision of new rights and a more participatory egalitarian democracy, even as diverse groups articulated what an effective citizenship meant to them in terms of longstanding inequities along racial, class, gender, and other lines. And so in this way, the popular movements traverse divides between the political and quotidian realms as they translated the desires of wide swaths of Brazilian society directly into the most elite of political institutions, the constitutional assembly. And in this way, the popular movements allow us to think about democratic transitions uh, beyond the confines of formal politics as multi-sided affairs in which a wide variety of groups fought over the contours of uh, Brazilian citizenship. So I'm gonna leave it there and uh, I, I look forward to uh, your uh, questions uh, and comments. Okay. Hi, so I take it, uh, so I get to respond, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, Dan, for this really interesting talk and for the, and for the quality of the paper that lay behind it. I'm gonna be responding um, to both, I think, at the same time. So I want to just start out by saying that um, I thought the paper was magnificent. Like I really, really appreciated reading it. And I love the, the complementarity with the talk, which in some ways follows the paper and in some ways departs from it. And, and in fact, some of that is kind of interesting to me about what, what made it in the paper and what couldn't. Um, I wanted to say, I thought you gave us a really convincing perspective on showcasing this process as a moment in which civil society organizations pushed open what would have otherwise been a closed and very controlled political process, right? Seeing this as this moment of popular mobilizing and organizing that allowed this to happen and what this means. Um, there's a fantastic focus on the self-awareness of that effort, right? That people cared 
and articulated an importance about the content of what they were doing, but also about the process of what they're doing. And I think that play is part of what you're getting at, right? The, the self-awareness of um, not just what they're doing, but how they're doing it, right? The kind of participation that's there. Um, the paper also shows a really wonderful grasp on an engagement with both established literature and some really exciting emerging new trends in some of the historiographical debates, which is not always easy to do. So I was really happy to see that. I do have a, an important literary suggestion I'm going to offer later on, um, but I thought that was fantastic. I've got lots of notes of other texts that I, that I want to catch up on. Um, and it was also just beautifully organized and wonderfully written. And so thank you for all of that. Um, and then finally, I, I concur entirely with one of the things you say at the introduction that this brings some very much needed attention to these um, to these popular amendments that have not received the kind of scholarly engagement that um, that they merit. So that's all great. Um, I want to just pose a couple of topics for for thought and for discussion, and to say I, I think when prefacing this, I I always feel that when you offer someone a paper they come at it with their own set of expectations, their own sets of questions, and they can sometimes give you comments that say, oh, I wish you had written this other paper, or I wish you had written this other thing or done this other thing. And I'm trying not to do that, but I'm also just wanting to be honest about the things that I saw and was curious about, put them out there and you can do whatever you like with them, right? It's not, these are not necessarily critiques. I thought the paper was wonderful. Um, these are more just like, oh, things that made me think about I wonder what you think about these things. Not like you you have to address all these 10 things in your paper or it's not, you know, it's not legitimate. It's a wonderful paper. Um, so I was curious, for example, about your decision to frame this within the history of constitution making, which was both in the written text and in your comments today, rather than within the history of mobilizing during the dictatorship. Because part of what you argue in the paper is that these popular amendments are an outgrowth of popular mobilizing. And so I wonder why you don't locate it within that process, right? You're actually saying this is a real departure from past constitutions. So you have a section where you show us, you know, these seven past constitutions and a little, you know, set up about what those have meant in Brazilian history. Um, but you don't really show us how the kind of um, scenario of real popular mobilizing under dictatorship leads to this, this new thing that's kind of taken as a given, right, that this is where this comes from. So that was one kind of curiosity for me. Um, and I would also say within that, if you do stick with thinking about the histories of constitutions, I was really wanting to know more about 1967 because I do think that the writing of the Constitution of 1967 is not only entirely germane to what you're doing, but also is a really interesting moment as well. And, you know, in the fact that it was contentious within the military, right, that they were not all completely um, on board with the way not only the new Constitution came out, but also the way institutional acts continued to emerge after the Constitution you know, because there was such an emphasis on constitutional legitimacy and that, you know, this revolution was legitimate and authentic and it had all the kind of um, um, levers of established authority to do what it did. Um, and so the fact that, you know, AI-1, which we now call AI-1, allowed the president to amend the constitution Nonetheless, they write a new constitution and then nonetheless, they write additional institutional acts after that. None of that was quite so simple as it might appear of like, oh, blatant exercise of power with no, um, with no pushback. There was in real internal debates about that. So that was one thing. And then, um, and then secondly, again, this is all just kind of been building up to your, your main focus. One topic that's left out as you talk about the emergence of the popular amendments is the amnesty of 1979 and the campaigns around that, which I see as really fundamental to this process in large part because some of the same actors who are seeking to recreate Brazilian politics and society after dictatorship are the ones advocating for amnesty and advocating for bringing back people who will help construct that democracy, right? Bringing you know, allowing them to run for office and allowing them to return from exile or, or, you know, all these various ways in which those figures who were seen as important political actors had been sidelined and that they needed to come back. So both the process of, you know, of securing amnesty and then the, the arrival or the re-arrival re or re 
engagement of important political actors. Um, so those are that's, that's so that's kind of like leading up into your topic. Um, a couple things just about as a reader that I wanted to point out now. Um, and this is one of the distinctions between the paper as written and the paper as delivered is that the paper as written didn't tell me as much about the content and the outcome of the amendments as your talk just now did. So like all of those fantastic slides that showed us the variety of various kinds of amendments, we, we, we get a small amount of that in the text, but not to that same degree. And so as a reader, I was often wanting that, you know, I got the sense that 83 met sig signature requirements. I wasn't sure how many really were included in the constitution, what kinds of things made it in, what kinds of things got rejected. It wasn't clear exactly how this was decided, what kinds of uh, votes and debates took place, especially if assembly members you wrote often didn't even listen to the defenses, they didn't have to go. And so that was sad <laughs> to think about these people making these impassioned, you know, well-considered speeches and the, and the assembly members weren't even there. So then I wondered how were these decisions made about what, what finally made it in. So just I would have, you know, as a reader was kind of always wanting a little bit more that you did give us more of that in, in your talk. Um, similarly, as a reader, I also, again, this is my kind of expectations as a historian, as I'm reading and what I'm looking for, and you may or may not want to follow this. I kept wanting to see more of the voices of the protagonists, and I don't get them so much until the fourth section. So there's a lot in the first three sections that feels kind of distant, that you've got this omniscient perspective of what's happening and you're summarizing and synthesizing so many different moving parts, but it sometimes makes me feel kind of removed from the protagonists who are doing amazing things and I want to hear from them. Um, so that's just, you know, again, kind of a stylistic question. Um, but then to go back to the, um, to the missing assembly figures who are not listening to the, to the speeches. I wanted to know, I wanted a better sense of who did hear these defenses or speeches in support, whatever you want to call them, um, and what this meant for a national conversation about the Constitution and the con reconstruction of democracy. There's a part in the paper where you talk about a media campaign against one of the amendments. And so you get a sense that there are times when the media is really harnessed to, to critique something. But I wondered about the media present throughout, like how, you know, who, who, these, if we're thinking about, there's a lot of popular mobilizing to get 30,000 plus signatures, but then once you get to the heart of what people are saying and how they're articulating the importance of these various amendments for the reconstruction of Brazilian democracy, who's part of that conversation? Are they speaking alone in a room with no assembly persons and no one is there to hear them? If the tree falls in the woods, you know, does it make a sound? Like who's hearing it? I presume, no, I presume that these are being discussed and debated in other places, but the paper doesn't show me how that happens. And so I wanted to see um, how this becomes part of a broader conversation. Um, two more, three more points. Um, this is kind of a, the, my bigger thing that I've been, that I was thinking about throughout the paper, which is that I had trouble thinking about the distinction between constructing democracy and redefining constitutionalism. So there's a sense in the paper that, that those organizing around popular amendments are thinking about rebuilding democracy um, from something that was not democracy. But I don't see that quite I don't hear that language so much in what they're saying. And I think what I'm thinking about is there was a focus during the dictatorship of a constitutionalism that the military was really committed to that was incredibly narrow, incredibly restricted, incredibly sort of, you know, um, I don't know. Yeah. If you, if you can write a document and affirm that this is legitimate, then it's legitimate, right? And that makes it constitutional. Whereas this kind of living, breathing, dynamic sense of constitutionalism, it almost feels like there, there's more, I see more of a change from a strict definition of constitutionalism to an ample, expansive, dynamic sense of constitutionalism rather than one around democracy. So that, at least, again, that's what I'm seeing, kind of creating a new kind of constitutionalism 
Um, and then what that might mean for democracy, right? That, that that is a partner in a new society in a new kind of democratic society. Um, and here I'm thinking of a text that was really influential in my thinking that, that despite your very thick historiography, I think escaped your attention, but it's, I would highly recommend it. I think you'd find it a great, a great book. Leonardo Barbosa, um, who wrote um, a book about the history of constitutionalism in Brazil um, and uh, works at the, at the Chamber of Deputies. So um, it's just, it's a beautiful book. And he talks a lot about, um, actually there's one chapter about this, the, the constitution, um, the, the citizen's constitution and one th that I think you would find really, really interesting. Um, so, so I'm thinking about his text of where he really looks at the, the narrowness of the idea of constitutionalism under the dictatorship. And so that was really, that was always in my mind as I was thinking about this paper. Um, and then one last comment, let me see. Oh yeah, two last comments. Um, one bigger and one smaller. You write in the introduction about the founding mythology of this kind of citizen's constitution. And you know I write or have written in the past about questions of memory. That very, that very setup about the constitution feels very much to me like a follow-up article by you is waiting to happen that will look at later memories of this process. Um, because certainly the creation of this constitution is read as a, as a victory, as a popular victory over dictatorship. And yet when we go back and look at what you've just shown us, I feel like part of the message of your article is that this was the, a moment of, of rupture or of possible rupture, a moment of potential promise but one that doesn't always really create the kinds of egalitarian citizenship that people were hoping for, right? That it, it opened up that potential. And then, you, I mean, you look at, uh, you know, Lilia Schwartz's latest book on authoritarianism, and it just kind of says like, there were all these promises and then it all, you know, gets shut down. I feel a little bit like you're not necessarily in tension with her, but in some ways, um, in some ways, um, there's some similarities in that perspective, um, that this was this moment, but we don't actually see it all come to fruition because you're kind of giving us this ominous uh, taste of what, what is to come. Um, so anyway, I guess I'm just thinking about um, the ways in which the process of this constitution becomes mythologized later. And then my final, 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 I promise, my final comment is that I really like the iconography in your, in your presentation and it wasn't in the paper. And I would love to see if you ever wanted to work with any of that, to think about, you know, the pictures of the, the closed Congress and the people forcing it open. It only seems to really augment what you're saying about the process as being part of the, of the message, right? That we are going to just like jam ourselves into that closed Congress. And there, for me, that actually was a moment when it felt more like democracy and less like strict constitutionalism, right? The very day-to-day -day functioning of democracy that the people are going to you know force themselves into democracy the people are going to carry a pen and the power of the pen is super mighty and it's going to like you know explode what we're doing so all in all a really fantastic paper i look forward to hearing what other people have to say as well so thank you very much for sharing this research with us thank you so much uh Sydney, should i respond very briefly or should do you want to go direct to questions I think that's a yes, piece. Yes, I think I think you can respond to Tori and then we, we move to our questions. Wonderful. So so thank you so much. And so like I said at the beginning, this is an article manuscript which is adjacent to but not directly from the book manuscript. So it's really helpful to feed, have this very kind of productive feedback as, as I move forward with it. Uh, and, and I absolutely agree uh, or or I, I, I take your question about why I framed it in terms of constitution making rather than the history of mobilization. In the book manuscript, it is explicitly focused on this question of mobilization. And so the popular amendments as a kind of form of the practice of democracy really have their origins in the petitions that grassroots movements would write to political authorities. In particular, one of the, uh, the Movimento do Cruz de Vida, uh, which is, right, is, is this movement of uh, principally of, of housewives, of popular class women from urban peripheries of Sao Paulo and other cities, 
launches this massive popular uh, this massive petition where they get 1.2 million signatures in 1978 and they send it to the military dictatorship and the organizers of the pppc of the major pro participation groups cite this petition as the inspiration for for the popular amendments in their form and one of the reasons i i was talking about con talking about this in the terms of constitution making is i was really trying to make sense of how is it that in these very ambiguous, highly pacted um, transitions is mean, is the meaning of the transitions really at play between social groups? And what is the importance of that meaning to the kinds of social and political outcomes that come out of it? Um, so, so very much in, in, in dialogue, dialogue with your, with, with your uh, own work. Uh, and certainly it could make more of the constitution of 1967 uh, and the dictatorship's own sort of preoccupation with maintaining constitutional legitimacy. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that the popular amendments get approved in the first place is exactly because of that preoccupation, because for the military and, and civilian allies and, and Sarney had obviously formerly been a member of that civilian coalition, uh, that one of the reasons that they allowed this at all, the popular amendments, um, was because of that 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 uh, that sort of narrow constitutionalism and fears of being uh, seen as illegitimate uh, stewards of Brazil's uh, dem democracy, uh, even if it had not been a democracy. And that I think speaks to a, a sort of a larger a larger um, uh, fact that kind of permeates this paper and in my larger project on forms of part participatory democracy that get somewhat or entirely adopted into uh, the, the political system, which is just the, the weakness of this coalition in, in, in a lot of ways, which is they're not coming at this from a position of strength. The popular amendments are more of a foot in the door rather than they are um, sort of remodeling the political system without. But I didn't want to end it on that kind of, kind of pessimistic note, but rather to, to sort of point and situate the transition and this very formalistic political process within these larger um, uh, uh, social mobilizations. Uh, and certainly, um, it, you know, one of, one of the logistical problems with having 122 uh, popular amendments is that in tracing their outcomes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just, uh, and one of the reasons it's so, it, it's kind of a difficult, it's a, it's a bit of a black box actually, why certain amendments got approved entirely or partially, this was something that was voted on behind closed doors. And the reasoning that came out of it um, was often highly technical. And so it, it, there was no sort of clear ideological pattern to which amendments were approved and which ones were not. But it is interesting to note, I think that um, about 40% of the popular amendments were partially or entirely approved, uh, which is a much higher rate than amendments proposed by constituent deputies through the uh, normal constitutional um, constitutional process. Just, um, I, and I, and I, I, I think that the, your comments on constructing democracy versus redefining constitution is going to be a particularly uh, productive one uh, for, for, me, for me moving forward. Uh, and, and I think one of the ways that you see, you get this ample sense of this as being a, a question of constitutionalism are all of these questions about sovereignty and legitimacy um, that undergird the constitutional order. And th as you would say, that, that's not necessarily an issue that has to do with democracy in and of itself, but rather of the constitutional order that engenders democracy. Uh, and so the popular movements as, as sort of vehicles for allowing civil society, and it's not necessarily exactly citizens, but rather citizens mediated through civil society to participate in the constitutional process um, is really a question of constitutionalism first and maybe democracy in a kind of second order, uh, in, a, in a second order. And I would really look forward to writing uh, an article on the founding mythology of the citizen constitution, which in and of itself, I think is, is part of this battle over the meaning of a political transition in which the progressive forces that really run with the idea of this as a citizen constitution are not the ones who are calling the political shots necessarily. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, for 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 folks who study this period, it, it may be a well-known fact, but for if you're, if you're not if you're less familiar, that the Constitutional Assembly was dominated by this block of kind of conservative and center-right um, center-right politicians, the, the central, uh, and, and so it was not at all a foregone conclusion that anything progressive would come out of this, a progressive constitution would come out of this, 
Um, certainly not one that expanded rights in the way that it and rights and in, in forms of democracy uh, in, in, the, in the way that it ultimately did. And so I'm gonna leave it right there um, and, I, and I look forward to questions, but thank you so much, Tori. Yeah, well, Dan, first, um, Francisca Espinoza asks for the title of your paper and where she can find it to read it. So, <laughs> uh, and I have a question from, from Darius Mans. He asks, in light of Brazil's need for political reform, militarization of Bolsonaro's administration and the limitations of federalism exposed by the pandemic. Does Brazil need a new constitution? <laughs> so so I, I will leave that question to to the Brazilians, but what, what I will say is um so the paper, so the paper uh, ha, has not even published yet, but is it is hopefully on its way to to being so. Um, I think I think what maybe what we can take from the experience of the popular amendments and thinking about constitutional renovation in Brazil is that they were always a part of these larger coalitions, these larger campaigns to influence uh, to influence politics. So uh, uh, to take one example, the agrarian reform amendment, which is ultimately unsuccessful, agrarian reform doesn't happen in the constitution, uh, was accompanied by massive mobilizations in favor of agrarian reform. It had a very active block of deputies within the constitutional assembly who were also working um, uh, concurrently. And so it's it's a kind of a, a kind of an all of above in the kitchen sink sort of approach to uh, enacting political reform. As a sort of narrower constitutional measure, the question of whether or not could something like the uh, the, the the mechanism for direct democracy that the popular uh, amendments installed be a part of this process, it's an interesting question, right? Because what what do they convey? They convey a certain level of popular legitimacy to political pushes. They're a rhetorical and discursive device as much as they are uh, a constitutional one. Um, there's actually some, so there's, a, there's a sort of constitutional uh, uh, vacuum in a sense in whether or not it's actually legal to use this initiative. So the cases that I cited uh, had to be reintroduced through the, normal, um, through the normal political process because the backers of it weren't exactly sure how to move it through the process. So it was actually something that Maybe within within a larger push to uh, remodel uh, Brazil's constitutional system, um, sh should that should that be uh, a, a useful thing, um, would need to be attended to uh, in looking to include popular participation directly uh, in the in the lawmaking process. Um, but as to whether or not uh, Brazil Brazil needs a new constitution, I I, um, I I I would say that my my personal opinion would be that uh, maybe not necessarily, uh, but uh, certainly, making the 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 paper paper rights into concrete realities is a challenge that uh, remains to this day. And in so much as you can see in the popular amendments, uh, sort of partial consolidation of the democratic dreams and aspirations of diverse groups within civil society. Um, I, I think you see that with the, the with the 1988 constitution to the present. All right. So I have a question from Mariana Casalato. How do you see the national public policy conferences in Brazil as a democratic tool in connection to the scenario you describe? And so the national policy the national conferences? public conferences, yeah. Okay. I imagine I imagine she's talking about these conferences that Lula keeps mentioning his interviews. Mm. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, um, so. T taking so I'm not entirely sure uh, what that's referring to I'll admit but um, I, I think what we can take that as is maybe where we can take that question is in, in what sense can trying to reinvigorate the kinds of associational life that led to the popular amendments be helpful in creating um, a broader co political coalition that can implement the promises of citizenship of a broader citizenship and popular participation that led to the popular amendments in the 1980s um, and I, th I think that's absolutely uh, a wonderful goal and something that can, uh, 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 that by looking back on this period that can be um, sort of uh, reformatted uh, in, the, in the current moment. 
Um, and in particular with the problems that the PT has had in activating uh, grassroots groups in the way that it formerly did. Um, I think that, that that kind of emphasis would be helpful, yeah. Um, Jairo Lima asks the following, did Dan's work check if popular amendments at some extent have been incorporated in the constitutional text? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so there's some great uh, um, legal theses that have kind of done that work of looking at the very, very kind of narrow question of what to what degree have these popular amendments been adopted. Uh, and in the book project, the four that I follow, um, and, I, and I trace entirely through the constitutional process, uh, like I said, uh, after the moment where the popular amendments are incorporated or not into the text, the constitution undergoes at least three major rounds of revision. Um, and because of the sort of complexities of way that language and text wind their way through these processes, it can be a little bit um, difficult to determine. Um, but obviously, obviously the mechanism for proposing laws and constitutional measures that I referenced at the end of, at the, end of the talk um, uh, are, came directly from a popular amendment. Uh, in the book project, one of the major contributions that's perhaps less widely known um, is in, comes from the popular health movement, uh, which is supported by the Reforma Sanitarista, as well as a coalition of grassroots groups. Uh, and that amendment becomes an integral part of the founding of the, sort of the constitutional justification for the SUS and establishing a right to health. And in particular, in instituting citizen, citizen oversight councils within the SUS um, at all different levels of the municipal, the state and the federal level. And then in subsequent years, um, those uh, citizen oversight councils become incorporated into all aspects of the welfare state. Um, and so that's a major uh, contribution of the popular amendments to sort of a broadening or, or, or uh, um, to, 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 shaping the, to shaping the Brazilian state as it, as it stands today. Um, uh, another one, I, I always get a little bit tickled by the monarchists and their sort of preoccupation <laughs> with using this as a way to restore the Bogansis to power. Um, they, they, that plebiscite is eventually held, and uh, um, they unfortunately, unfortunately, if you're if you're uh, on that team, they, they lose there. Um, yeah. Um, oh, the question actually, it's a follow up. Maybe you want to add something else. The question by Eros mm -hmm. Federico da Silva. He says the Brazilian re-democratization process was born out of social movements, especially held with social participation. How do you understand today the importance of establishing institutional mechanisms for social participation that are effective? Yeah, so I think I would go back to one of the quotes from um, Valjeo Ganza, who read the amendment, uh, read the, did the defense in, in favor of the agrarian reform amendment, in which he said that these forms of uh, direct democracy of popular participation really served as kind of elementary schools of uh, creating new kinds of citizens. You know, to kind of harken back a little bit to this larger history of social mobilization, um, one of the great benefactors of the popular amendments and these forms of direct democracy is of course the uh, progressive Catholic church. And in particular, in, in particular uh, liberation theologians who saw participation both in associational life and then in mechanisms like uh, supporting a popular amendment or in the citizen oversight councils within the welfare state as a way to shape new kinds of conscious citizens who would correct the unrepresentative aspects of Brazilian politics and Brazilian democracy um, from both without the political system through, through uh, social pressure on politicians and the, and, and the system at large, um, but by incorporating these popular, uh, these popular methods of uh, forms of democracy into the state itself, hopefully from within as well. Uh, and so, you know, in, in thinking about, you know, uh, there's, a, there's always a talk on the Brazilian left of going back to the Basis. And, um, you know, one way to do that would be to, uh, to try and reinvigorate this culture of participation in, uh, in, in these forms of uh, direct democracy and, and uh, deliberative democracy. Dan, there is a, another question by Eros Frederico da Silva. Dan, in your view, can effective social participation be associated with the realization of the welfare state? Uh, with the realization of the welfare state. Um, I think that it, when, we think, when we think about the understanding of what democracy was that accompanied the, the popular amendments, uh, it, it was, both a participatory democracy and a social democracy. 
So the idea that social rights, so they, they very much held the idea that social rights were integral to uh, a functioning democracy. Um, um, and in particular, a democracy which permitted and encouraged the uh, popular class people of working class people to, uh, to play a major part. Um, and a major part of that in turn was uh, having, uh, having people participate and shape the parts of the state that touch their lives most directly. Um, and that's particularly relevant in the case of the health movements, but it, but it kind of spread to all different areas of the welfare state, um, education and to childcare, to the to public childcare system. Um, uh, you know, other examples that are sort of a little bit beyond the welfare state, but have to do with state finances. Uh, participatory budgeting is, is another sort of element of, of that uh, sense of citizenship. Um, and so hopefully that kind of answered the question in saying that um, it's a, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's all, it's all kind of take kind of kind of uh, emerges together and, in, and, in and, uh, um, in, and, uh, in, in shaping these uh, ideas about uh, direct democracy. Okay, I have another question there. Um, mm -hmm. This is from Carolina Castel Branco. She says, I want to express my respect for Dan McDonald for the courage to study the Brazilian popular participation process in the making of Brazil's 1988 constitution. Do you think that the popular amendments are just a step to give the constitution an element of validation considering the world scenery at that time? Yeah, so I think that the, the way that these questions about legitimacy played into uh, into making popular participation a part of this process. Uh, on the part of the former civilian allies of the dictatorship of the kind of center right and right wing, they were certainly cognizant and always had been cognizant of perceptions of Brazil's uh, political process and of the transition uh, as a whole, just as they had been during the dictatorship years. And so these calls about, uh, or the, these allegations that the process might be illegitimate if it didn't include a kind of broader democratic franchise certainly played a role um, in their incorporation or I wouldn't say allowance, but because there was a great deal of political pressure, but accedence to including the popular amendments as part of this process definitely had to do with perceptions uh, uh, with, with the hope that there, this process would be seen um, as, as, as a, a validation. And there's a kind of tricky way, I think, too, that by, again, acceding to, not necessarily allowing this sort of rhetoric of democratization and of a broader, more effective citizenship to flourish around the idea of the constitution, that they also could try and hope to get the world to forget about the fact that they weren't doing human rights trials or um, truth commissions and things of that nature that this was in fact Brazil going on to a brighter, more prosperous democratic future and you know, forget, all about, forget about all that other stuff that, uh, that, uh, that's happening in Argentina and Chile, um, but not happening in Brazil. Um, and I think on the part of the forces that were primarily pushing for popular participation, uh, using that question of validation of sort of legitimacy uh, was a way to, uh, to leverage the process to the extent that they could affect the outcomes that came out of the constitution. And like Tori had said in, their, said in her comments, they were very self-aware um, of the fact that shaping that understanding mattered um, both to the final outcomes of the constitution, but in, uh, in down the road, making those paper rights into uh, concrete material realities. Uh, Dan, I, uh... Let me take advantage of the fact that there's no answers here waiting for you to, so that I can ask my own questions. No mm -hmm. questions for the question. And I'll throw in one more me. when you're done, if you, if I can. Yeah, yeah, and then I will. Okay, yeah, then, then of course I'll give Tori the chance of, of Go ahead. going back to it. Um, well, first of all, uh, just a general comment. I I really like um, the way you you frame an argument because if, as a social historian. The fact that there are all these popular amendments and maybe very few of them made it into the final text of the constitution. Of course, it matters to see the, what the results, actual results were, but it perhaps matters as much that um, the, the experience of defeat matters, right? I mean, the mobilization, and then you, you know, maybe you don't make it at that point, 
but you create a mobilization and an expectation that changes the terms of the of the political conversation. So I think I think um, uh, um, proposing something and being defeated it still matters a lot about how things are going to to evolve. And and this is, mm -hmm. I, I as I understand what you're saying, it, it matters even when it doesn't result immediately in in, in something. Uh, but, but but the question I can't avoid at this point is. Um, about the military and what the constitution says about the military and their intervention in politics. Um, you know, do you know that there's this crazy argument now that uh, the military, uh, the constitution allows the military to act as a, a moderating power, going back to this constitutional mm -hmm. characteristic that was in the eight, in 18, 24 constitution. That is the Brazilian constitution that I know very well because I'm a 19th century person. And I know one thing has nothing to do with the other. I mean, the moderating power uh, had a whole chapter in the constitution explaining how it worked and so on and so forth. It has nothing to do with this you know, brief mention uh, uh, to what the military can do and, and that they use it as a justification for intervention. But the question that is, why wasn't it possible to do more during the constitution to submit the military to the rule of law unmistakably? I mean, why, why, why was it so difficult? Or was it tried? To what extent was it tried? And how could that have been different? I know it's a counterfactual question, but I just wanted to know to what extent it was tried or if it was not even an issue at the time. Tori, do you want to do you want to chime in? And I'll answer. Sure. My question is is unrelated to that one, but I'll, I'll throw it in okay. and you can think of them both. Um, well, first, I was just going to say that I loved I loved all the questions from the the, the various um, participants here, and it speaks a lot, Dan, to how relevant your work is for our continued struggles. Right? That there's there's so much that connects it, and it made me think when people were asking some of the questions, it made me think about you know just how um, unprecedented this is. And whether or not this became a model or is or is currently being considered as a model process for any place else, right? We know that in the wake of um, you know, regimes of state terrorism, that many of the kind of transitional justice efforts people have learned from other places and built on and modified and thought about them, you know, to the extent that this was um, um, uh, effective or simply as one questioner asked, you know, you know, for the English to see, um, you know, or, you know, kind of creating some kind of consensus to the extent that this was a process of reconciliation. Um, I wondered if this has been talked about in any other places. And then finally, just a tiny, tiny little thing is I also was struck throughout the reading of the paper and talking about it right now in this context of the number 30,000 and of that significance of that number for Argentina. And I just always think like, how did they get to the number 30,000? Because 30,000 becomes this like rallying cry in Brazil. That's a very different 30,000 than it is in Argentina. So that's tiny, but I, you know, it's kind of lumped it all in there. Dan, before I, I give yeah. you the word in your, for your closing remarks, let me uh, read the last question. I have one question, so we can't, mm -hmm. we can't miss it. Uh, it's from Kim Wright, Wright King. Um, and the question is, in what ways in Brazil's 1988 constitution, more in, uh, is Brazilian, I'm sorry, in what ways is Brazil's 1988 constitution more inclusive than the US constitution? Specific to affirmative action, in what ways can or should Brazil's constitution be advanced to more facilitate to facilitate a genuine racial democracy, not its current mythic one? So these are the last questions. So you, you are you have the word for your closing remarks addressing these questions as as you see fit. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, everyone, for those for those questions. Uh, and and so I really I I really like this idea that defeat shapes the experience of the popular amendments because of course it is through repeated defeats um, that uh, that that they even become possible in the, in the first place uh, and, and speaking of defeat in the way that it can be sort of informative and, and, and informative uh, in shaping future political movements uh, I didn't talk about them in the talk today but uh, in the paper I note that certain movements uh, Use the popular amendments in a partial manner. They weren't able to get over the signature threshold to defend them, 
or they kind of made um, kind of abortive attempts to, to, to utilize them, but never ended up submitting them. Um, and in particular, the, uh, the Movimiento Negro Unificado and a really um, able uh, or active, uh, 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 but small cohort of deputies in the Christian Assembly tried uh, ultimately successfully to ban racial discrimination uh, in Brazil and to include that in the constitution. Um, and uh, in the example of the gay rights movement um, in thinking about uh, Jim Green's work on, the, on this time period uh, as well, that the movement sort of drafted a popular amendment but wasn't able to actually get very many signatures to it because it was at a low point and kind of nadir in its, in its, in its organizational capacity but that these sort of partial defeats and defeats became ways to insert the idea, insert this idea into the political process writ large and then to follow up and elaborate on it. Um, and even in the case where uh, popular amendments were successful or push for particular kinds of rights were successful in making those things a reality and then in um, uh, threading them through the uh, state and municipal constitutions that were written after the federal constitution, because after that, the entire constitutional framework on down to the local level is rewritten. Um, these become further opportunities to either follow up on these defeats or um, to follow up in victories, as it were. Uh, and so on the question of military intervention in politics, uh, in the literature on the on, on the Constitutional Assembly, there's a sort of recognition that progressive politicians writ large tended to focus on issues of social rights and welfare and tended to concentrate themselves in those committees. Um, and as a result that this kind of left the uh, sort of political, uh, the sort of political structure of the constitution more susceptible to uh, folks who were not friendly uh, to the idea of holding the military accountable or creating stricter constitutional guidelines that expressly prohibited uh, the, the, uh, the military from uh, intervening unilaterally in politics. Um, but the popular amendment in this case actually played a, a very big role in discussing this openly. And one of the very, very few um, instances where this happens uh, there is only one effort to my knowledge that I've been able to discover where a constituent deputy raised this issue, and that was Irma Fassoni, uh, who is a progressive deputy, uh, comes out of the grassroots movements in Sao Paulo, and she introduces uh, measures to recognize torture uh, and extrajudicial imprisonment during the uh, dictatorship years. Um, but it really does speak to the way that, uh, at least in this case, that the popular movements were um, indicative in 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 uh, in, uh, in bringing that issue uh, to the to, to public discussion, but as to why why they why why they weren't able to or why they didn't uh, 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 were more successful on that front, it's it's a difficult question. I think it has to do with the relative weakness of progressive forces in that time period. I'm not entirely sure what the the counterfactual uh, would have been in order to make it uh, to either make a bigger issue of it or to include effective constitutional safeguards against it. Um, maybe that's one way in which uh, uh, Iniciativa Popular can be useful in the future is trying to institute those safeguards from outside, from outside the political system as part of a broader coalition. Um, and so the exact mechanism of popular amendments are to my knowledge not directly utilized after the Brazilian case, but it does engender a really remarkable period in which direct participation by the public and by civil society groups becomes a very common part of constitutions. Whereas prior to this, that was, that was relatively unheard of. And that accompanies um, both the process of redemocratization in, uh, in Latin America, then the Colombian constitution that is written shortly, there, shortly after the Brazilian one also includes uh, mechanisms for direct democracy that are um, that are, that, are, that are inspired by the, by the Brazilian case. Um, but it also becomes very influential in encouraging this kind of, uh, this kind of constitutional framework um, in post-colonial states in Africa and in South Asia, and then uh, to, to a lesser degree, but still present um, in the rewriting of Eastern European constitutions uh, in the wake of the, the fall of the Soviet bloc. As for the number 30,000, that's a very interesting sort of parallel to the Argentine case. I have no idea why 30,000 was the number that they hit on as the, uh, as the, um, as a number for the signature threshold. Uh, I've not been able to discover why that was the case. Maybe 
uh, maybe, maybe further further work will reveal why. Uh, but it is an interesting that one is that one is a symbol of um, uh, the horrors of dictatorship, and the other is a is a part of a, a you know, perhaps a hopeful story of democratic restoration. Um, and on the question of whether on, on the degree to which uh, the U the Brazilian constitution is more inclusive than the U.S. constitution in particular um, with regards to Afro-Brazilians or uh, um, uh, with Black folks more generally. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting case. I mean, there's, there's a really great literature that uh, addresses this question uh, directly. Um, and certainly the, the histories are quite divergent. Um, and I know that for um, thinking uh, the work of Tiana Paixel, uh, uh, as well as others, that for many years, it was a, it was a great struggle for uh, the Black movement in Brazil to force open discussion of issues of racial discrimination or that it even existed in Brazil as late as the 1970s. Uh, there were Brazilian, I remember the famous case of a Brazilian diplomat who, who, who said at the UN that, uh, that racism did not exist in Brazil. And so that's a, a very different sort of uh, trajectory than in the U.S. case um, uh, with, the, with the civil rights movement from the 1960s on forward. Um, but as for the degree to which these measures can be uh, uh, useful, uh, the measures that are included in the 19th Constitution can be useful to uh, instituting greater, greater racial equality, uh, I think that that hinges in part on the larger issue that faces the uh, the constitution of 1988, which is if it were entirely enforced, Brazil would be the most egalitarian country on planet earth. Um, and so uh, the, the great problem always lies in the, in the distance between the text and material, material realities. Um, and I know that's a distance that uh, a great many social activists have been trying for a very long time to close. Oh, that's a very fit closing. Um... Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Tori. That was a wonderful conversation and uh, I feel privileged to, to have been here with you. Thank you, all of you who have asked questions, really wonderful questions. And uh, thank you, thank you all. See you next time. Thank you all. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you, Tori. Thank you, everyone.